Good evening, everyone. My name is Michelle. I'm a product specialist here at Oculus. Welcome to tonight's clinical webcast, how to get the most out of your Penicam for the cataract and refractive surgery using the holiday report. The holiday interpretation guidelines can also be found in the handout section of your GoToWebinar screen. You also have a text box where you can enter questions. Feel free to enter your questions during or immediately after the presentation, and we will discuss them throughout tonight's webcast. One of our speakers tonight is Dr. Yuri McKee. Dr. McKee completed his clinical and surgical training at Emory Eye Center in Atlanta, Georgia. He completed his surgical internship at the University of Minnesota. Dr. McKee specializes in advanced corneal transplant techniques, premium cataract surgery, anterior segment reconstruction, glaucoma surgery, LASIK, and refractive surgery. He has authored peer-reviewed articles on corneal transplantation and repair of dislocated interocular lenses, and numerous chapters in textbooks. He served as executive editor for three books on advanced ophthalmic surgery and holds a patent for novel sustained ocular surface drug delivery system. Our second speaker tonight is Dr. Jack Holliday. Dr. Holliday received a medical degree and distinguished alumnus award from the University of Texas and a master's and bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Southern uh, Methodist University. He is a clinical professor of ophthalmology at Baylor College of Medicine, the author of five books, hundreds of chapters and articles in peer-reviewed scientific journals, and serves on several editorial, medical, and scientific advisory boards, as well as holding numerous patents. He is currently the chair of the FDA AAO task force charged with developing guidelines for accommodating and extended depth of focus IOLs and the section editor of clinical optics for the ocular surgery news. Welcome Dr. McKee and Dr. Holliday. Thank you, Michelle. It's a pleasure to be here this evening and uh, it is an honor to share how to get the most out of your Pentacam uh, for the cataract and refractive surgery using the holiday report. And the holiday report is something that uh, many people at Oculus have worked on with me over the past almost 15 years now. Uh, and the goal of our report is very simple. It's to facilitate the presentation of information for the busy cataract refractive surgeon to provide the highest quality of care. And as I said, many people have worked on that and I'm very proud of the display that we have because it does make it very efficient as you see when we go over this for the clinician to be able to very quickly get the information that he needs uh, to take good care of his patients. Now, the first thing that we will see is that you must have uh, a version of the holiday report of your software that's at least more recent than 1.21 revision 33. And that was done almost two years ago in January of 25. So if you don't have a version that is more recent than that, you need to contact uh, Oculus USA so that they can update and they can do that remotely so that you have the latest software, so you can uh, see everything that uh, we're doing and that the reports that you have will be exactly the same as uh, I'm showing tonight. Now, one of the things that you'll see is that the display settings that we have, have a, uh, they're fixed. In other words, you can't do anything to change the display, and there's a reason for that. The reason is that I have spent 40 years coming up with the right display, with the right sensitivity, and all of those things that are important to get the display just right, and that when the user goes in and starts making adjustments, they mess it up, basically, and that what you see is no longer what it should be. So, for example, the two exams below are identical. They were sent to me. They're not only identical, they're the same exam. The one on the left was sent to me by a user. He sent the report and he says, gee, Dr. Holiday, everything that I look on there is green and it's normal. 
and then I said, well, yeah, you know, you're right. Everything looks green to me. And then I looked at the settings and realized they had adjusted every single one of the settings to values that made it look green. And the exact identical exam on the right is what you should see when you have the settings appropriately uh, set. And so you can adjust that. It's set that way specifically so that we talk about the same things. And the sensitivity is such that when you see red, it's bad. And when you see blue and green, it's good. And everything on all of the reports is set that way. So that's why we do that. So we get the same exact thing. Now, one thing that you have to know right off the bat are these overlays. There's only five that you need to know, but let me show you what these are. The first overlay is the dashed black and white line that's a perimeter. You notice it's not a perfect circle, and this is the pupil margin. So when you look at the pupil, this dashed black and white line perimeter is basically the pupil margin. The second thing that you see is this white cross with the black cross in the center, and that is the pupil center. This is the middle or what we call the centroid of this perimeter. The third thing is the limbal or geometric center of the iris, and this is what we would call the geometric center of the cornea, uh, and uh, or the optical center. And so this point is important for us to reference because this is actually the optical center of the cornea. The fourth is this white circle with a black dot in the middle, and that fourth one is the visual axis, or what we call vertex normal. And the difference between vertex normal, where you see the light reflex come back from the cornea, and the visual axis is less than five microns, even in the most unusual person, and it's usually right on the button. So this is the visual axis or vertex normal. And then five, this black circle that you see here, is where the minimum uh, pachymetry occurs in the cornea. All right, so to review those, the dash black and white is the pupil margin. The white cross with the black cross in the center is the pupil center. This is the limbal center, the brackets. The vertex normal or visual axis is this white circle with the black dot. And then pachymetry minimum is the black circle. So those are the five overlays that you need to remember in order to be able to see uh, everything that we want you to see on the map. All right, now. This is the page one of the holiday report. And what you'll see is there's three panels on the top. The first panel has the demographic information that you need. It allows you to put in a description of what it is, the date of birth, the exam date, which I, what time it was taken. The center panel we'll talk about has important values for IOL calculations. And then the third panel, has additional parameters that are helpful for the refractive and the cataract surgeon. And we'll talk about those. Then we have a uh, first column that's going to be our topography, second column, which will be the pachymetry, and the third column will be the elevations. So that's how we display these six different uh, maps and the panels above. Now let's take a look at the middle panel there first, because that's very important to us. Now, that upper middle panel that you see here is uh, has a number of values on it that are important to us. Now, these values that you see here are, number one, the equivalent K reading, 65. We call it the EKR 65. Now, that EKR 65 basically is the K readings that you're going to end up using for your IOL power calculations, and we'll talk about those for in a little bit. Uh, but they here, the flat one with its axis, the steep one with its axis, the mean, the average power, the astigmatism, and these values are uh, what we would say is equivalent to the total keratometry on the IOL master, 
it reflects not only the front surface power, but also includes the back surface power of astigmatism. And we'll talk more about that in a, in a minute because these are called equivalent K reading 65 because there's the K readings that you, you should use in the IOL calculation. But they reflect both front and back surface power and we'll tell how we put that together in just a little bit. It also has um, over here a Q value, which is normally minus 0.26 in a normal cornea, which is the shape of the cornea. But more importantly, we have the total SA, total spherical aberration. Now, most people think that the spherical aberration in Zernike's is the 4-0 term, but in fact, that's not true. It's the 4 plus the 6 plus the 8. In other words, there's three terms that give you total spherical aberration, and that's what we need to know, and that's what this value is right here. The normal in the human population is 0.27, and you use that to determine the appropriate aspheric lens to use. So this patient's 244, and aspheric lenses come in zero from BNL, minus 18 from Alcon, and minus 27 from J and J. And so you try to match these up to try to eliminate the spherical aberration in the human eye. Uh, and this is the value that gives you that. Now, the other thing is that the ratio of the back to the front radii of the cornea are about 82.2% on the normal. And we'll see that when we start seeing refractive surgery patients, that percentage changes. But that percentage allows me to determine the amount of refractive surgery that was done on the front of the cornea. And I'll show you how that works. And then the final value on there is this RMS, root mean square, higher order wavefront error over a six millimeter zone. Now I know that's a mouthful, but what that represents is the RMS value of the higher order aberration of the wavefront over a six millimeter zone of the cornea. Now, this is very important because that value determines the quality of that six millimeter zone on the cornea. Now, you remember the cornea is converging the ray, so it drops from six millimeters at the cornea plane to down to about 5.3 or 4 at the IOL plane, which is where the optics are passing through uh, the interocular lens. So, this value has been determined to be the one that tells you the quality of the cornea. It's much better than looking at a simple coma term or much better than looking at an individual because it gives you the overall performance of the cornea except for sphere and cylinder. Everything else is reflected in that value. And that value in the normal population is 0.370 microns. So if you took 100 patients, that would be the average. Studies have shown that if it's over 0.66, people begin to complain of poor vision. Halos, glare, poor optical quality, can't read well, that's not good. And over one micron, they all complain. Here it goes gradually from about 0.66 up to one are the people that have complaints, but they're not severe. And over one, they're very severe everybody complains of the quality of their vision. So this value very simply gives you the quality that you need to know of how good the quality of the image that's performed, that the cornea is able to produce. And if that image is not good, well, you'll know that because this value will be the value that you need to look at. And you would say, gee, if this patient's got one micron, I'm not going to use a multifocal lens because they already have a compromise in the optics of the cornea and they wouldn't perform well. Okay, so those are all of the values that we get on this upper middle panel. Now, when we look at the upper right panel, we see that we have the pupil diameter which because the lights are bright when we take an image on the pentacam, that bright image ends up with a, a small pupil, so it's a photopic pupil size. It gives us the location of the pupil relative to vertex normal 
It gives us the white to white relative vertex normal. And then most importantly, it gives us a, where the pachymetry min is, it gives us the value 550 here and says that this is 0.67 millimeters temporal and 0.4 millimeters inferior to the vertex normal. Now, what we'll see is that this vertical displacement inferiorly, it's always inferior, when that's over a certain value, that it's a problem. It's actually 0.61. But uh, so we'll look at those. So the pupil's photopic, the white to white diameter is given. Uh, the location uh, should never be more than 0.61 millimeters below vertex normal. We actually flag this in yellow uh, when it's above that value because it means that that's too low, and it usually means keratoconus. Now, these values down here are also helpful. This estimated pre-refractive corneal power is important because it tells you what the corneal power was before refractive surgery. Now, how do we do that? Well, it's simple. If we know the back radius of the cornea and we know that normal is 82.2%, well, I can calculate what the radius of the cornea should be. And that's what this value is. Now, plus or minus two tenths of a diopter, this is a normal cornea. They haven't had any refractive change, but that's about the tolerances that you get. The anterior chamber depth, of course, you need for IOL power calculations in the newer formulas today. And this chord mu is the distance from the center of the pupil to the visual axis. All right, so the estimated pre-refractive K, this value right here, you do that for IOL power calculations that use the double K method uh, for calculating the IOL power. And it's easy to understand that if you had somebody with a 45 diopter cornea and did a minus five LASIK and came out 40, you wouldn't want to use the 40 to size the eye. That 40 is not the right value. You want to use the 45. And that's what this value is when you don't have that. You don't have the historical method. You don't have the history of the patient. Then this value allows you to have a value that you can put into like the IOL consultant for what the pre-refractive K was, as well as the current K, like the EKR65, and that takes all of those things into account, so it calculates the right effective lens position and the right IOL power. Now, chord mu, that's the last thing down here on the bottom. Now, the normal chord mu, the distance from the center of the pupil to the visual axis is 0.2 millimeters, and when it's above 0.42, on the um, on the Pentacam, that value means that you don't want to use a multifocal lens. Patients will complain of halos and glare. Now I need to explain something here because the value for cord mu on the Pentacam using Shine Fluke measures the actual distance from the center of the pupil to the visual axis at the iris plane. And that value is about two tenths of a millimeter. Now, on a keratometer or at the slit lamp, when you're looking in the eye, the cornea magnifies the pupil size and it also displaces it temporally. So the center of the pupil that you see through the cornea with the slit lamp is not where it is, actually is. It's called the apparent cord view. And the apparent cord mu is actually three tenths of a millimeter. It's about 50% more than the value that you get that's the actual measurement on the pentacam. So you have to realize that values that you get using Placido Disc, IOL Master, Keratometer, Lenstar, to, and all of those things, topography, measure the apparent displacement. So it's 0.3. And the upper limit, is 0.6. On the Pitacam, that value is 0.42 for the upper limit, and the normal is 0.2. So this is the value that you would uh, be concerned about when the value is above 0.42 on the Pitacam. That's 
uh, abnormal, and above that, the placement of a multifocal lens are associated with halos and glare, and that comes from studies from Argerwal and studies from, there's a Czechoslovakian article, but basically, you'd want to be careful about that because the visual performance is not good. All right, so now we have six maps. The colors go from blue to red. Now, you know, I used to have arguments with Steve Kleitz all the time because he's got 31 colors, and it goes from pink to magenta. Now, I can't even tell the difference between magenta and pink. It all looks the same to me. And so you can't tell. And I can tell you right now, after 40 years, I know that a clinician cannot distinguish more than 15 primary colors from blue to red. That's why we've chosen those, because you can see distinct changes on the topography. So column one will be topography. Column two will be corneal thickness. And column three will be the elevation. Blue will be normal or better than normal. Green's normal. Yellow suspicious and red is abnormal. All right, so now let's look at these columns and see what they are. Okay, so in the first column here, this upper map is uh, called the axial or sagittal map. And what it does is it actually allows you to uh, see two things. The axial power map, which is this top one, is the one that measures the radius of curvature from the center of the Earth to the surface. So the Earth is 8,000 miles in diameter, 4,000 miles at the center. So it would measure a radius on the Earth of 4,000 miles to the center, okay? And the curvature would be one over 4,000 miles. A tangential map, on the other hand, does not care where the center of the big circle is. So if you had a Mount Everest and it was a hemisphere, on the axial map, the distance would go from 4,000 miles from the center of the Earth to 4,006 miles, the height of Mount Everest, and you wouldn't even see a blip on the screen. On a tangential map, however, it would say, gee, 4,000 miles is the curvature of the Earth, and six miles is the curvature of Mount Everest if it were a hemisphere, and 4,000 to six is a big change. So the tangential map, which gives you a relative curvature as opposed to an absolute, is much more sensitive. So you see all these little broken hemi-meridians because the semi-meridians are irregular. Over here, it doesn't show up because it's measuring an axial radius, so it's not as big a difference. Now, this one is actually clinically more reflective of what the power changes in the cornea are. But this one geometrically is much more sensitive. So you'll see in a normal patient, these are still have regular Myers and look good. This is a patient that has pretty good Myers, but still has some irregularity, okay? And that will show up on that uh, RMS HOA error when we see it. All right, so this is the axial and that's the tangential map. Now, the next one we have is the pachymetry map. This map is absolute. It shows you the thicknesses from the center to the periphery that get thicker as we go out. This black circle is the uh, thinnest point of the cornea, and that bracket is, of course, the center of the cornea or the limbus. And this absolute map always goes from thin to thick, okay? So it always looks like a Looney Tune. It goes from a a uh, yellow to a blue because the cornea is getting thicker. It's a meniscus lens, meniscus minus lens, thin in the center and thick on the periphery. Now, the relative pachymetry map is different. The relative pachymetry map gives you percentages of how much thicker or thinner the cornea will be in percent compared to what it should be at that point. So this point right here is six-tenths of a percent thinner than normal. This point right here is one-tenth of a percent thicker. 
So this is a normal cornea. It's not till it gets up to about 5% that these values are a problem. But anyway, the relative pachymetry map gives you a percentage of how much above or below normal it would be at that specific point. So we'll see that's helpful for us when we're looking at areas of the cone. Now, the elevation map, which is shown here, has a front and a back, okay? Now, again, like I argue with Steve Kleiss, I argue with Michael Bellin because he wants to use a sphere as a reference. And I said, the reference should be what's normal, not a sphere. The cornea is not spherical. It's a prolate ellipsoid. It looks like the nose of a rocket ship. The cornea is steepest in the center and the radius gets flatter as we move out. It's a prolate ellipsoid. So, as we said, that normal Q value is minus 26, so we can make a normal ellipsoid with a standard Q value and use that as the reference. If you use a sphere, the cornea is always above the sphere in the center, and it's always below the sphere in the periphery because it's a prolate ellipsoid. So we use the prolate ellipsoid as the reference. And what you see here is values are green. They're all zero, a few microns up or above or below uh, is normal. And then the same thing on the posterior surface. We use the normal asphericity, the normal curvature, and it's a prolate ellipsoid. And once again, we get values that are normal so that there's zero on most individuals and only if you have an abnormality do you get an elevation above. The other thing that we do is we make it a toric ellipsoid, not a sphere, so that astigmatism doesn't show up as this band going across the cornea. The band goes away if you take into account a toric prolate ellipsoid. So this is how we have the six maps arranged. Now page two of the report looks like this. The first thing we have is the EKR65 versus the pupil size. And we use 4.5 millimeters. Now people say, well, gee, the standard keratometer measures three millimeters and the IOL master measures two and a half and the lens star measures two. Why would you use four and a half millimeters? Because it's a zone. And now let me explain it, all right? So the normal pupil size for a 70-year-old person in a refracting lane that's in mesopic conditions is four and a half millimeters. That's the average pupil size of your cataract patient when you set them in a lane and have the light stem down to low for measuring their visual acuity. So when we determine the power of that cornea, we do it over the four and a half millimeter zone and use 40,000 points on the front and the back surface of the cornea and then calculate the best fit toric ellipsoid to tell us the power of that zone that best represents its refractive power as a K reading. Now, the masters, the old keratometer masters like Jabal and those guys, Germans, they were all pretty smart. Jabal wasn't, but they were all pretty smart guys. And they said, well, gee, if we take a ring measurement, what should be the size of the ring? If we could take one ring and weren't looking at 40,000 points, but we were only looking at two, what would be the best diameter ring to use? And the answer is 3.2 millimeters. They made the keratometer 3.2 because the area inside 3.2 and the area outside 3.2 for a four and a half millimeter pupil are equal. They're both 50%. So that's why they chose 3.2. Now, when they went down to two and a half and two, well, not, that ring now is not even uh, split the areas in half. It's more weighted towards the center. And the result is that it's closer to that apex, and so you get a higher power. In fact, that's the reason why A constants had to change 
back in the late 90s is because when we went from the manual keratometer at 3.2 to the IOL master at 2.5, the difference in the corneal power was three-tenths of a diopter stronger. And that three-tenths of a diopter stronger is why all the ACONs that changed in the late 90s didn't have anything to do with going from immersion A scan to optical biometry, axial length, because Wolfgang Haggis calibrated to immersion A scan. Those are, if you take 100 patients, you get the same thing with immersion A scan as you get with the optical biometer. Now, you get a difference on an individual, but you don't get a difference uh, for uh, a large study of patients. So that's the reason why we uh, end up uh, between basically changing the A constant is because. So what I tried to explain is the four and a half millimeter pupil size determines it for the zone and would be equivalent to a 3.2 millimeter ring of keratometry that split the areas in and outside the circle equally. And that's why those uh, 3.2. So the four and a half millimeter zone still has the best correlation with keratometric measurements because it does the zone and comes up with that. Now the EKR value 65 will be different because as I said, it reflects the back surface power. Now, uh, angle kappa, okay. Now there's a question then, and it goes back to this chord mu and angle kappa. And uh, to just to make that quick, we don't measure angles in ophthalmology. Okay, angle kappa, we measure the cord length between the pupil center and the visual axis. And angles, you have to have a synoptophore. That's the only way you can measure the angular measurements in an eye is with a synoptophore. You have the patient look at something and then look at something else and you measure the angle that they go through. We don't measure angles. We measure the distance between two points and then use a formula to convert from that cord to an angle. So uh, Daniel Chang and George Waring the fourth wrote an article on cord mu, and basically cord mu is that distance from the light reflex to the center of the pupil. So you never measure an angle. You always are using cord mu, and so we never do use angle kappa. It's a theoretical measurement that you can measure on a synoptophore, but cord mu is the measurement that is reported on all of the optical biometers and on the pentacan. So that's where that uh, that's where that comes from. Okay, so back to this. The four and a half millimeter pupil size is used on the EKR65 with 40,000 points, and it comes up with the best power of the cornea with 40,000 points reflecting both the back and the front surface power in both astigmatism and refractive power. Now, that blue curve that you see right here is the EKR65, and this is a normal patient. And what we see is that the power of the cornea, if this is the dead center, the one millimeter zone, begins to slightly increase as we go out by about a diopter and a quarter when we get out to about this. So the normal cornea has about a diopter and a quarter, or a diopter and a half, of spherical aberration. The power of the cornea actually increases by about a doctor and a quarter in the normal individual from the center to the periphery. And that's why an aspheric lens that's minus 0.27 changes about minus one and a quarter doctors from the center to the periphery and cancels that out. So a spherical aberration of plus 0.27 in the cornea is about a diopter and a quarter of increase in power out to a six millimeter diameter and an intraocular lens that's minus 27 will have a, a reduction in power from the center to the periphery. So now uh, I had a question, what's the EKR65 stand for? Well, the EKR65, EKR stands for equivalent power because 
in the normal cornea, if we got a K reading of 45, and it's a normal cornea that's 82.2% from the back to the front ratio, the asphericity is the same and everything's right, well, we want to get 45 diopters. So what we do is you'll see that we only reflect the difference in the back surface power from the front so that we can say a 45 diopter cornea that's normal in every way will still be reported as 45 diopters. And it's only if its back surface power is abnormal that that K value will change. And the EKR65 we're going to talk about now. The EKR65 65 has to do with this. Now, this is a normal corneum that we see here. And look what we have. It says we have a peak at 46. We have a peak at 43 and a half. And we have power in between. So this is a histogram of the distribution of the power over this six millimeter, or in this case, the four and a half millimeter zone. So this is a distribution of the powers in the four and a half millimeter zone in a histogram in terms of frequency. So we've got a lot of 43 and a half, a lot of 46, and a little bit of the average in between. And that's what this is showing. We've got a lot of stronger power in this peak. We've got some flatter power, which is another peak. And then in between, we've got these other powers, and this is a histogram of that. The EKR65, uses a software that goes in and figures out from studies that I've done over the years that the best refracting power in terms of the astigmatism and the refracting power that you can represent. And we'll see when we look into keratoconus patient in a second that the average is not always the right value. We'll see in a minute that that's not true and I'll show you why. So uh, here the IKR is just a graphic display of these powers and this is a histogram of how the powers are actually distributed on this graph okay iol power calculations and this is what i was leading up to the pentacam measures the front and the back surface and the ekr65 doesn't take the average of all the powers. And I'll show you why in just a second. But it's not net power. Net power of the cornea is about a diopter less than the keratometric value. And what we wanted to do is not have to go out and change every K reading, uh, every lens constant, by reporting the net true net power of the cornea. In fact, every IOL power formula available today does that conversion from keratometric power to net power as the first step? Binkhorst did that. It's about a diopter less. Binkhorst, Olson, uh, Barrett, Holiday, every single one of us make that conversion as the very first step from keratometric power to net power. So we don't want to report a net power, otherwise, the interocular lens power formulas would end up double compensating. So we want a K reading that comes out the same on a normal individual. So here's what I'm saying. The keratometry, but adjust for the back surface power from normal. So if we had a cornea with a radius of 7.5 and the cornea on keratometry measured 45, if that back surface power were normal, then we'd report 45 diopters. But if the back surface power was three tenths of a diopter stronger than normal, then we'd subtract that three tenths of a diopter and report 44.7. The net power is 43.3. So the easy way to say that is the EKR value reports the value that takes into account the back surface power difference from normal. In fact, the IOL master total K does the same thing. They report the same way. Now, when we look at these first, and we're gonna talk just a little bit more about what that 65 means in a minute, but here's our first patient. Now let's take a look at this. All right, now, the first thing you notice is 
look at these semi-meridians. They're all over the place. And the fact is that because they're like this, there's no way you're ever going to come up with a toric lens axis as the right position of placement because there is no right axis. There may be an optimal place, but you can't find that looking at keratometry, okay? Because it's very, very irregular. So the first thing you should look at when you look at these axial power maps is the regularity of the semi-meridians on the axial map. Now, it turns out that the tangential map often has irregularity, but it's very rare on the axial map. All right, now. Now let's look at this for just a second. Now this is a uh, is a uh, an eye that is from a moderate keratoconic patient. Now look what we have. Here's the hot spot. We notice that the power actually instead of what we saw before, where we had this thing where it gradually increases is maximum in the center in the one millimeter zone and then begins to go down. But more importantly, we see two peaks. We see a peak here at about 40, which is this peak that you see right here, right there, and that's these paracentral power. And then we also see a hot spot peak that is right here, and that's this one. So we have a pair of 44.5 peak and a 40 peak, okay? And that's what happens in keratocornus. And uh, the power of the peak is what a keratometer measures. And the reason is that little bump gets a reflection that's convex, and so it always measures the peak. So it's going to give you a K reading of about 45 right here. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to say if I had a bifocal IOL that had a power that was five diopters in a small zone in the middle and Plano in the remainder of that lens, I will tell you right now that like a bifocal interocular lens, you don't look through the average power. You look through the paracentral power for distance, and you look through the add power for near. And the keratoconic cornea is exactly like a contact lens or an interocular lens that's refractive with a cap on it that has a plus five diopter power or whatever the keratoconic power is. And what you'll find is that a, um, a patient with keratoconus mild like this one with that five diopter cap will be able to hold a uh, J1 plus print at about 10 to 15 to 20 centimeters in front of the eye and read down to the smallest line you can show them because they've got a bifocal cap in the cornea. They don't look through that cap for distance. They look through the paracentral area and that's where the EKR 65. It actually, they don't look to just this peak because it's gradual out here. And the EKR65, after looking at a lot of patients with cones, irregular corneas, refractive surgery, that EKR65 gives you the best power. And what you see here is, look, the EKR65 mean is 42 and a half. It's down here. Whereas that peak power that you get from the keratometer will be 45 diopters. And so uh, that's what we end up with, with the EKR 65. That 65 means we don't take the average. We actually look at the 65% maximum power for distance, and that's where it comes up. Now, we just had a question, and that question was, well, I said that the uh, cornea was prolate. Why, if it's prolate, uh, does the power of the cornea increase further out? And that's a tricky question because here's what happened. And let me see if I can explain. The cornea is prolate for absolutely sure. It's steeper in the center, steeper radius, and gets flatter in the periphery, okay? But that Q value is minus 26. 
in order to be prolate enough to have no spherical aberration and no increase in power, the Q value would have to be minus 54. And so it's about halfway between. So even though the cornea gets flatter as we move from the center, it doesn't get flat enough. It's about halfway between the perfect ellipsoid and a sphere. So it still has about half the spherical aberration that you would get from the perfect ellipsoid. So the perfect ellipsoid at minus 52 would be zero. The normal cornea is one and a quarter spherical aberration, and a sphere would actually have two and a half diopters of spherical aberration. So the cornea is still prolate, steepest at the center, but it still has about half the spherical aberration of a sphere, so that's what it goes up to one and a quarter. All right, now, what I just went through that showed you how the EKR65 works works well for all of these things, post-refractive, post-PKP, keratoconus, corneal scar, any cause of irregular astigmatism, those 40,000 points that we measure on the front and the back surface are going to allow me to come up with a keratometric equivalent that will be the best value that you can do on an IOL power calculation. Now, when I show you that, I have to show you this picture at the same time. This is a normal cornea, a LASIK, and an RK. In the normal cornea, look at that peak. There's only a three diopter range, and the cornea, as I said, goes up about a diopter and a quarter out to six millimeters. A LASIK patient is flattest in the center and goes up much more rapidly because we flatten more in the center than we do in the periphery and we get this. An RK patient does this, but the big point is there's a 13 diopter spread in an RK, a 5 diopter in a LASIK, and only 3 in a normal. So the point is that the bigger the spread, the higher the range, the more difficult it is to come up with the perfect power. So in RK patients, we're not going to get the same precision as we get in a LASIK, and we're not going to get the same precision in a LASIK that we get in a normal because the irregularity in the cornea makes the precision with which we can measure much less. All right, so the EKR65 works for all of those irregularity conditions that I just showed you. The four and a half millimeter zone is the one that's equivalent to the mesopic pupil of most patients, but there are patients that have been on myotics that have abnormally small pupils for whatever reason. So if you see a patient that's in the refracting lane in mesopic conditions and their pupil's only three millimeters, well then yes, you want to go down to that three millimeter zone because their pupil's three millimeters in dim light. Okay, but the normal person is four and a half. That's why we use that value as the recommended. Now, thinning disorders. Okay, when we were looking at thinning disorders, remember I said the normal vertical location down is about minus 19. And I said, if that pachymetry min is inferior by more than 0.61 diopters, that's probably the most uh, important indicator of keratogonus of anything we look at. Now we're gonna see hot spots on the topography and hot spots on the relative pachymetry and hot spots on the elevation maps, but this value right here is the one that is probably the most critical. All right, so let's take a look at a patient here. All right, well, the first thing we do is we take a look at a couple of things. You notice that the RMS value up here is 413. We said the normal was 37. Not too bad, but a little higher than normal. We also see that actually the Myers here uh, are pretty good on the axial map, but we notice that on the tangential map that they're pretty irregular. We got this little hot spot. It shows up in orange here, and we notice that 
that's inferiorly displaced. And we look up here and we see it's 0.9 millimeter. Well, that's bigger than 0.61. We look down here, not much. 1.3%, 2% around that, 2.1 in that area. We look over here on the elevation map, green. 2.33 microns. We look over here and we see a 5 micron and it's yellow, but it's not red. So the only thing that was really suggestive that this would be a cone is this inferior displacement because all the rest of these are just suspicious. If that were not down here and was up there, I'd say that wasn't keratoconus. Now this is the left eye and there's the right eye. It's always asymmetric keratoconus. It's never the same in each eye. But now look at the right eye. Hot spots, decentered zone, very thin, 8% red spot here, red spot there, and a red spot here. Now, that posterior elevation, the back elevation, is always more important in keratoconus because even though there's a nipple on the cornea, the upper lid goes across that bump and flattens it out so the normal four to six epithelial cells that are four to six microns thick for a thickness of about 50 microns of the normal epithelium ends up rubbing those epithelial cells so that you end up instead of six with two or three. And it reduces the height of the cone on the front surface. Well, that can't happen on the back. So here you see 52 versus 25. Well, 25, that's three epithelial cells difference. And that's a result of that upper lid moving across that. So you always look at the posterior float, not the front, because the epithelium always gets rubbed off of that front surface and it's just never as high as the back. So this was clearly a case of keratoconus, but that inferior uh, displacement was a critical factor on the one that was marginal. Now, when we look here, again, recognition, all right? We got a crab. We got a crab here. We've got a thin spot right down here. So this is not only elevated, but it's thin right here. Well, this is pollution marginal degeneration. And what you see here is that that's elevated dramatically on the front and the back surface here. So this is a classic picture of a pollution marginal degeneration. And again, it's got an elevation and thinning in the area down here at six. It's got the relative pachymetry, which shows how thin this is. And you see how elevated it is. So this is the classic uh pollution marginal degeneration picture all right and let's see here here's the other eye that was the right eye this is the left eye and you see how severe that was uh and again we see the thinning below the elevation a little bit on one side here the elevations that we have and this relative thinning area that's down here at the bottom of the cornea all right, another case. We look here, we see the Myers are distorted on both maps, so this guy's got a regular astigmatism. We notice that there's some steepening above up here, doesn't mean much. We look here and we see that the cornea is extremely thin in the center. It's actually 25.6% thinner than normal in this central area. But we look over here at the elevation map and we see it's minus five, so that's nothing. And right here it's plus two, so it's not elevated. So this is the typical post LASIK picture where the cornea has been thinned down to a point of 395 microns in the center, okay? But no elevation posteriorly, so we're not worried about it. Here's the other eye. A little steepening here, 35 percent thinner, 334, not bad here, but look at the posterior, 
14 microns elevated. This is ectasia. So this is an example of a patient with ectasia that uh, is a result of that posterior elevation coming forward. So we're about five minutes ahead of schedule here. Uh, Dr. McKeego. So uh, I obviously am not in the same universe as Dr. Holliday uh, with his knowledge of the Panicam or optics in general. I actually failed math in college, um, <laughs> but I've clawed my way back uh, to understanding these things. And so uh, I want you to take what he just explained to you and, and try to then apply that to a case. And so I'm going to just show you a case. And I have many of these cases, but this is a, a keratoconus case. And, and of course, this is a doctor. Uh, so you, you can't miss. Right? They, they trust that you know what you're talking about. So I want to talk to you about the utility of using the EKR65 in keratoconus IOL power estimation. And I've worded this as though a lawyer has a gun to my head. IOL power estimation. We call it calculations, but we're really estimating this. And patients really need to know this. I also share my calculation methods and I show the Pentacam images to the patient and I do the calculation right in front of them. So they understand the variability that is inherent in these measurements and these estimations, and they, uh, they can have a good understanding of why I'm not promising them any particular outcome. So let's talk about this case, a 59-year-old female. She has keratoconus. She's known it for a long time. She's now developed cataracts. Now, she had cross-linking in February of this year, uh, and I'm going to show you, number one, how the Pentacam helped me know that she was stable after the cross-linking. Uh, and then number two, she wanted a myopic result. She was used to being myopic. She liked it. She wanted to be able to see to put her hard contact lenses in. And a minus two result uh, is really nice for that. She can read and she can see to put her contacts in when, when uh, she wants to. Um, and uh, what I want you to do here is compare what the normal biometers would have estimated for her IOL power versus what EKR told us to do when we plug that into the formulas. So uh, obviously, this uh, lady had keratoconus. I'm just going to focus on the left eye here. You can see uh, clearly uh, inferior steepening. Uh, and um, so you know, I knew that I couldn't just plug her into the Lens Star or the Iowa Master and hope for the best. And I, I don't think it's right just to simply say, well, you know, you're probably going to have a hyperopic miss. So just go ahead and uh, aim for minus 2. And if you wanted minus 2, aim for minus 4. That's not what they're paying us to do. Like that's not why we buy these fancy machines. I think a lot of people have these really cool machines and they don't know the half of how to use them. And, and that's a shame because we pay a lot of money for them. And I get my money's worth out of this machine for sure in spades. Now, this is one thing I want to show you, uh, which Dr. Holliday didn't discuss. And if you don't know, you can do a difference map on your Panicam. So basically, I've got a scan here from December of 2019, then a scan from June of 2020. And it's showing a uh, very little change. And a lot of times you do cross-linking, you don't see a huge flattening. You just see a, a, a rest of the progression. And so she's had no progression over six months. And uh, this is actually pretty similar to what she's had uh, for a few years now. And, but I did do the cross-linking uh, before we did surgery just to make sure she didn't continue to progress or at least reduce the chance that she continues to progress later in her life for whatever reason. Uh, so... She's, got, she's actually slightly flatter after cross-linking, but this difference map is very important. I use this to track progression of keratoconus to decide when to cross-link, and then I use it after cross-linking to show that it was effective and no further progression has occurred. Now, Dr. Holliday showed you what the EKR65 looks like, and, and this is page two here, which is showing you a little bit more detail. And what I want to really uh, point out is that there is a bimodal distribution of the corneal powers in uh, across this cornea, and the EKR65 is 42.9, so that's the highest peak here. And so that's very important to point out that you, know, you could choose any number in here if you use random keratometry that's not taking into account the fact that this cornea is highly irregular. So we don't want to measure 2 or 4 or 16 or, or 32 different spots in the cornea and ask what the differences are, because there's so many differences, you're going to get a number that's not appropriate, and it's going to actually uh, underestimate, uh, or excuse me, overestimate the difference, and then underestimate your IOL power that you need. 
for example, this is the lens star. And you can see here that they are calling the average K closer to 43 or 44, actually 43.8. Uh, and so if I use the Barrett formula here, it's calling for a 24 diopter lens. And if I use the Hill, it's calling for a 24.5. These are good formulas. The formulas are not malfunctioning. What we're doing is we're putting bad data into the formula. And you can't fix your bad data with a good formula. You need good data. It's far more important to have good data, even if you use an older formula, than if you use a brand new formula with bad data. So as you can see here, uh, there's a wide variability uh, in the numbers. Uh, they've got a flat K of 41 and a steep K of 47, and an average K of closer to 44. And remember these numbers, either a 24 or a 24 and a half is what the best formulas out there are calling for. Uh, this is an atlas, and uh, I don't recommend using the auto Ks or the simulated Ks in the atlas. They're really not designed to do IOL calculations. Uh, but you can see it's between 43 and 46. So again, overestimating what the refractive power of this cornea in its center really is. Uh, I also have a Cassini on there, uh, and it's doing the same thing. It's calling the average K44. So I've got all these things listed here. The Atlas SimK, average 44, Cassini average 45, Pentacam, just the, the regular SimKs were 43.4, uh, which was the closest to the EKR65 at 42.9, and the Lenstar was calling it 44. So if the EKR is correct, then the keratometry and all other modalities has been overestimated by anywhere from a half a diopter to two and a half diopters, which is going to lead to that big of a hyperopic miss. And if we use the lens star case alone and just did a lens star, didn't even do a topography in this patient, didn't pick up that she had keratoconus or she didn't tell us, we'd have a 1.1 diopter hyperopic miss. People don't like to miss hyperopic. Here's what I did. I used a 25.5 diopter lens. I didn't make that up. I put the EKR value, EKR65 value, into the average anterior corneal power for my calculations. And then I used the, the regular biometry that was consistent otherwise. My predicted outcome here, if you look at the uh, right side of the screen, I was aiming for a minus two outcome, and the predicted spherical equivalent was minus 2.11. If you look at her uh, final post operative refraction in August of 2020, uh, her spherical equivalent is minus 2.3, and we predicted it'd be a minus 2.11. So the difference is 0 0.19 diopters. Uh, I dare you to show me that accuracy with any other way of measuring a keratoconic cornea. Uh, it, it just isn't there. And uh, she could actually read the 2020 line with this, and of course, with her hard context, she was very good. So she's extremely pleased with this, and she can certainly see well enough up close to read and even to put her contact lens in, even with... Uh, as much astigmatism as she has in her refraction. So why do I recommend the EKR65 for all cases of keratoconus? Well, as I proved to you here in just this one case, uh, the miss was only uh, almost two tenths of a diopter, which is well within the standard deviation of manufacturing limits for an IOL anyway. Uh, if I had used the lens star or other refractive uh, measuring devices or keratometry measuring devices. I would have had a, a hyperopic miss. If I had aimed for Plano, she'd be terribly unhappy with me. No other means of measuring keratometry was accurate in this case. And I have many other cases I can show you where, again, they all have a higher uh, estimated corneal average power, which leads you to underpower your lens and have hyperopic misses. And this is why many people will advocate, well, just aim for a little bit more nearsightedness than you want. Well, that's, I don't think, an appropriate approach in this day and age when we have this technology that shows us exactly what we need to do. So that's just a simple uh, uh, example of why EKR65 is important in keratoconus. Of course, it's uh, important in post-refractive eyes as well. And if you can understand everything that uh, Dr. Holiday was talking about uh, on that Holiday report, you've really got a good grasp of what's going on and really, uh, you know, not missing prior refractive surgery, not missing keratoconus, and then using those numbers appropriately. Now, I do want to add one thing, and that is that some of these formulas are estimating the posterior corneal power, uh, specifically Barrett, all right? And they're using that either through a measured or through a nomogram. Now, you can't use the EKR65 and then plug it into one of those formulas because now you've double dipped on estimating the posterior corneal power and you could miss. Uh, so plugging in the EKR65 directly into, for example, the holiday formula uh, will certainly give you a closer estimate of the proper IOL power than it would be that if you used bad data and used a 
advanced formula like uh, Hill RBF with uh, uh, artificial intelligence, or if you double dipped uh, and used the Barrett that already estimated what the posterior coronal curvature was on top of the EKR65 already taking that into account. So Dr. Holliday, do you have any comments on uh, on this case? I would say that, uh, you know, the the <laughs> the Barrett, the Holiday, the Hill, all of those formulas, the first thing that we do is down one diopter because we know the keratometric power is about one diopter more than the actual virgins or optical power of the real cornea. And I've worked with the people from several different companies and uh, Graham used the true K and the other stuff. The average, if you took a hundred patients and you took total K and true K and uh, keratometry, you'd find that the average of all of those would be the same, just like it is on the EKR65. And it's the unusual patient that has, that actually is the one that that adjustment takes place on. So, uh, so what I'm saying is that EKR65, you could plug it into the Barrett formula or the holiday or anything else. And it will all it does is compensates for the back surface, and he doesn't. Uh, and so what I'm saying is the back surface power doesn't add or subtract to the keratometric power. It does change the axis. So if you're using a toric lens, order of adopter against the rule on almost everybody, where you do double. When you use the EKR65, and then you use somebody that made an assumption like the Barrett calculator that you've got a quarter of a doctor against the rule, then you double dip. So it double dips on toricity, but. Thank you, Dr. McKee and Dr. Holliday. Just a reminder, on your GoToWebinar screen, there is a text box where you can enter any questions you may have. If you missed part of the webinar or if there's anything you would like to go back and review, you will receive a link to the recording in next week. All right, Dr. Holliday, here's your first question. Does the cord mu cutoff value of 0.42 apply to all multifocal IOLs, or are there some multifocal IOLs you can be more flexible with? Well, the uh, 0.42 value, uh, which is again of the value for cord mu uh, that you should think about before you use a diffractive lens. Now, that diffractive lens can be multifocal, bifocal, trifocal, or even an EDOF lens because it's the diffractive properties of that lens that actually, and it may be that with an EDOF, the brightness of the halo is a little bit less. It doesn't matter because when a person sees halos at night against a dark background, they complain whether it's uh, a certain, or not, because the background is black. So the point is you should consider that 0.42 value as an from EDOF to trifocal to bifocal and including the power. A patient that's very forgiving and they are so happy with anything, well, you might consider that as a spectrum and maybe do something in that patient. But if it's an average patient, that cutoff is twice the normal value, which we said was 0 0.20. So when it's more than twice the normal value, then you need to be considered that that patient is going to have halos and glare, and any diffractive lens is not a good uh, choice. Along a similar line of that question, uh, with a borderline cord mu, will you choose a segmented IOL like the ones from Oculentis or a Symphony IOL? Well, that that that's a good question. Now, now a segmented IOL is not a uh, diffractive IOL. It doesn't split the light 
uh, and have higher order aberrations that are about 18 to 20 percent. The symphony is a diffractive lens. It's actually a 1.75 diopter bifocal uh, diffractive lens. But that uh, bifocal power at 175 is so close to zero that there's no dip between the distance and the near focal length. So it becomes almost continuous, and that gradual change turns it into an EDOF lens. But it's still a diffractive lens. And so the higher diffractive lenses from that forward scatter still cause halos and glare. And so what I would say is because the symphony is diffractive, that would not be a good choice. The, uh, the, the segmented lens, like the oculinus lenses, well, those lenses are not the same. They actually split the light segment and coming back up. So you might, it's, it's not a limit for those, and there's no studies that show that they have more halos and glare uh, when that uh, uh, forward view is large. So the answer is no for the uh, for the uh, symphony and yes for the uh, segmented IOL. It's okay. Thank you, Dr. Holliday. Okay, we have a question for Dr. McKee. Uh, which formula do you use with the EKR65 case? Well, you know, you can use any formula you like. The, the Holiday formula is actually uh, nicely suited for it. Um, uh, because uh, you know you can easily access it, uh, and uh, I use uh, if you noticed on there the Veracity uh, program, so I can actually work several different formulas alongside each other without any additional keystrokes, and make sure that they're agreeing with each other. And, and largely they do. So again, it's it's better to have good data than it is to have uh, a specific uh, IOL calculation or estimation model. Um, the only thing that, and Dr. Holiday touched on this, is if you've already estimated the back power of the cornea, just be careful with plugging the EKR65 into there because it could, as you said, change the toricity a bit. But you can go to use the Hill RBF or the Holiday or even the basic uh, um, modeling that's done by Graham Barrett, and you'll get all very similar estimations. Yeah, and I think that's a good point. Uh... That, that I think uh, you're absolutely right, Dr. McKee. And here, here's, here's the thing. The article that we published with Ron Mellis about two years ago, showed that the difference between the Barrett, the Holiday 1, the Holiday 2, uh, were about 2% of difference in plus or minus 50. In other words, a half a diopter and it was the holiday one, it was 80%. So it was about a 2% difference between those performance. Now, what I will say is you have to be careful. Uh, Warren pulled his formula out of that because when he reports that with the neural net, which been around for 50 years, you can't exclude what you call out of bounds. You can't say I've got a 90% success rate and then say, well, I also excluded 10% because 90% of 90% is 80%, okay? So you just need to be sure in those studies when you're comparing those formulas that you look at that they included all the cases that were uh, provided for all the formulas because we have a screening process, for example, in the holiday uh, software and stuff that screens and tells you, I identified 90% of the time that uh, those patients that are gonna have, and that identification is a simple screening process. And the biggest one, the biggest one is, if a patient has had an equal refraction in both eyes their whole life, adult life before cataract, they cannot have an intraocular lens power that's more than one diopter difference 
between the two eyes. And I see this all the time. They come in, the patient's been Plano or minus two or whatever in both eyes for 60 years, and they come in and get a 19 diopter calc in one eye and a 21 in the other. You have to use common sense. And basically what I tell people is the axial lengths can never be more than three tenths of a diopter. The case can be never more than one diopter different. And the IOL power, somebody that's been binocular and scleriopsis their whole life. Common sense. Other questions? You know, that should, that should raise a big red flag when, when you know, you're cut from the same cloth on both sides and something's not matching up. That raises a lot of big red flags for me. And it can be anything from a transposition error to a bad set of data. You always have to make sure that whatever biometer you're using, you've validated the, the criteria on every set of data. Otherwise, you don't know what you're, you're looking at. The other thing I'll say is that for the uh, Hill formula, you know, Warren has used uh, thousands of cases, but it was designed to look at, at normal eyes, uh, as were all the formulas. No one has actually made a formula designed to look at keratoconus. So the EKR65 is not a formula. It's a, it's a, it is a formula, but it's a measurement. It's a formula to right. give you an appropriate measurement. It's not an IOL calculation formula. So until we get, you know, if we had hundreds of thousands of cases of keratoconus and we plug them into the radial basis function method that Warren uses, then we'd have a specific IOL calculator for keratoconus, but that's not how it works. So these are things I explain to patients as noise in the system that'll keep me from giving them a perfect result on top of the fact that their cornea is highly irregular and we'll never have a perfect result. That's exactly right. Uh, that's exactly right, Yuri. And, and the point is the Virgin's formula that, that Gauss came up with over 160 years ago, if you put in position for the lens and the right length, you always get the right answer. There's no question. Nobody argues that the Gaussian formula or Snell's law is incorrect. But what happens is lens, you get the wrong answer. And that's what these measurement devices do. And that's the other thing that, that for example, Doug Koch hit on the axial length of the eye. All optical biometers measure the length of the eye too long over 26 millimeters. They measure them longer than they are actually are. What happened is the Holiday 1 and 2, for example, we developed on ultrasound. And so when the optical biometer came out and we made that conversion, it made mistakes on long eyes. That 2% difference between uh, Graham and the holiday one and two was because long eyes were uh, wrong. And so we came up with the Wayne Coke adjustment for long eyes, the long eyes as being correct, all of a sudden that difference goes away. So it's just uh, exactly, Yuri, if you put in garbage into the calculation. There's nothing wrong with the formulas. Not accurate. Okay, Michelle, what else we got? Thank you very much for that in-depth answer. All right, we have a couple questions about uh, angle alpha. One of the questions is, uh, where can you locate that on the holiday report? But, and another portion of that question is, cord mu is uh, similar to angle kappa, but with other devices, it measures angle alpha. Uh, can you help clear up the confusion? Yeah. And the difference between them? Okay, can you uh, switch over to me? Here's the question they're asking, okay. Now, uh, the center of the, right up here in the upper right-hand corner in this panel, all right, it, now that white-to-white -white measurement is basically, though, the, uh, the visible iris or the limbus. And this X and Y tells you where they are. So this is the X and Y values for angle alpha. Now, what is angle alpha? 
is basically the angle between the visual axis, which is from this little light reflex that we see right here, and the center of the iris or limbus, which is right here, and that's a distance from that white light to that little bracket would be angle alpha, all right? Now, the point is, there's uh, no use for angle alpha. I mean, there's no clinical use for it. The one that we used to do was the one between that light reflex and the center of the pupil, which is that little plus. And what happened is that that is given right up here on the right as cord mu. This is basically what you used to call angle kappa. Now, what we used to do is say, okay, one millimeter is seven and a half degrees. All right. So 0.3 millimeters would be two and a half degrees. So 0.3, 0.27 millimeters degrees. So we would convert that from millimeters to degrees by going one millimeter, seven and a half degrees on the cornea. And that's basically converting to angle kappa. But what uh, Daniel Chang and George Waring were saying is that that basically uh, strabismologists will argue with you and tell you, well, you're not really measuring an angle because not everybody's cornea is one millimeter per seven and a half degrees. The only thing you can measure that on is what's called a synoptophore. Well, who has a synoptophore? Nobody. Not even strabismologists. What happens is They've eliminated the angular dimension and just used the tenths of a millimeter to measure the distance from the light reflex to the center of the pupil. And that's all they've done. And they call it a cord. And so cord mu is what we've been measuring for the last 50 years. We just converted it to degrees and called it angle kappa. But cord mu is the new word for that distance between the pupils, that cord mu should not be more than 0.4, and the normal value is 0.2. How advanced does the keratoconus have to be before you will be able to see it and detect it on the holiday report, or how early can you catch it? Well, that's a good question. And again, as we pointed out, about things being yellow and red. When it's yellow, it's suspicious. So this keratoconus example slide here is one that you wouldn't necessarily, with. if this is all you had, you couldn't be that. We see that the, the axial power maps in the first column are yellow with just a hint map but not anything to prove that it's keratoconus. The second thing, though, is that the second column, when we look at that black circle in the upper central map, we see that when we look up at pachymetry min in the upper right-hand corner, that that is 0 0.90 millimeters inferior. Now, when that happens, we said 0 0.61 was the uh, upper limit for normal. And so that right there is very suspicious for keratoconus. And if that was the only thing you had, I wouldn't hang my hat on that, but it's almost 90% true that that's the case. But if that were say six tenths of a millimeter, then I'd just put it in this suspicious column. And when we look over here, we see that there's one value in the lower right-hand corner that's 10 microns and it's orange. So again, this is a suspicious case. And what happens is whenever that's yellow, then you, but it will pick up anything that is suspicious for keratoconus and being yellow. Look at the other eye, the right eye, it's 100% sure that that's keratoconus. So yes, that left eye was an early form for us keratoconus case, 
that basically was right at the level. You look at bilaterality and see asymmetry. You look at the uh, inferior displacement of pachymetry min, and then you look along those columns to see if the red or orange or yellow line up, and if they do, well, then you know that that's very suspicious for keratoconus, form breast keratoconus, and you would bet a PRK in somebody that was older, because obviously the same amount of thinness and the same amount of progression in the younger person is much more of a risk than it is in the older person, because the older person has already with their own aging process, whereas the young person is at much higher risk. All right, thank you for that answer. That is all the time we have for tonight. Thank you for everyone who sent in questions and thanks everyone for joining us. And thank you so much, Dr. McKee and Dr. Holliday. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thanks everybody. This concludes the presentation, and on behalf of Oculus, good night, everyone. Good night.